Hey Optimancers, Chris here. On this channel we tend to talk about character features and which character features I think are effective. Uh, but sometimes there's character features that normally are somewhat effective or not very effective, but when they're combined with something else specifically, then they can be effective. Uh, these are what we call good combinations. So today I want to talk about some of the good combinations I'm aware of and then maybe you can let me know any of the combinations that you like down in the comments down below. So let's get started. Now I think all these combinations are reasonably effective, but in some cases I think these combinations are better known than other ones. So I'm going to kind of start with the ones that I think are the best known ones. Things like when we have a wolf totem barbarian. That can give advantage to our allies, so obviously that's going to combine well with things like greater weapon mastery, or characters that rely on doing critical damage like uh, Paladin. Uh, they'll have a much better chance of getting a critical when they're attacking with advantage. And speaking of Paladins, things like the Crusader's Mantle spell. I've talked about this very recently, and combining it with things like summon spells, animate deads, or with animate objects because you can get so many more creatures with that Crusader's Mantle and it's going to be a lot more damage. Another combination I think is reasonably well known is using Grapple or the Sentinel feat to keep somebody immobile while there's an effect near them where they're going to take damage at the end of their round. Something like a Flaming Sphere. Generally with a Flaming Sphere you bump it into an enemy, they take a little bit of damage and then on their turn they move and then you do it again. But if you can grapple them or hold them in place with something like the Sentinel Feet or even cause them difficulty in moving by doing something like a Booming Blade, then you can punish them or make it difficult for them to leave that square so that they're more likely to take that additional Flaming Sphere damage. Now the Hex spell is a great spell for combining with other spells because it provides no saving throw and you can assign a disadvantage to any ability check of your choice. And there's certain spells that require ability checks. So when we can combine these together, it tends to work very well. One example, if you hit somebody with a hex spell and then you hit them with the wrathful smite, what we can do is we can use the hex spell to give them disadvantage on their wisdom checks. And then as long as they fail their initial saving throw against that wrathful smite, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to break that frightened condition. Furthermore, it's going to use their action every round to make that attempt with disadvantage. So it, we can potentially not just keep them frightened, but eat up their actions round after round. Obviously, Hex also works really well with things like Grapple or work very well with things that are caught in a web because they have to make that ability check to get out. One combination I think is really well known right now is the Warlock being able to use Devil's Sight and Darkness as a way of being able to blind everyone else while they can still see. Uh, usually we'll give them advantage on their attacks, disadvantage to be attacked, so it kind of ends up being like an improved invisibility, but it's often available much earlier. Now the Flame Arrow spell is a spell that generally I'm not a big fan of because I don't think it is going to add as much damage in general as you would expect from something like a Hunter's Mark or a Hex spell. But Flame Arrow can be given to somebody else and if we can combine it with something like a Fighter with Action Surge we could potentially get a lot of arrows in the air in one round and then it could end up being a significant amount of damage that you're able to cause with that spell. Won't last very long but we're concentrating on it anyways so if it's only going to last for a couple rounds then maybe that's not such a big deal. It can also combine reasonably well with somebody who's got a Swift Quiver. One combination that just about every Barbarian uses is combining Reckless Attack and Rage because Reckless Attack of course is going to be more likely to make you a target of your enemies but the Rage is potentially going to give you resistance to their attacks. So you encourage them to attack you but they do less damage. But another way that we can create a good combination with this is with the Heroism spell. Because the Heroism spell is adding extra temporary hit points every round we can expect a Barbarian who's using Reckless Attack to have those hit points removed every round, but because they have resistance to the damage, then we can double the amount of temporary hit points we're giving every round. It might be a case where they can't even dig into the Barbarian's actual hit points. 
But another combination that I recently talked about was the possibility of doing a Barbarian mixed with something that maybe gets a Fire Shield spell. Uh, and then you could use Fire Shield plus Heroism plus Reckless Attack plus Rage. Now obviously the Heroism has to be cast by somebody else, uh, but the Barbarian would be able to cast Fire Shield on themselves because it doesn't require concentration. They can maintain it even while they're in Rage. So then what would happen is the enemies are going to be attacked with Reckless Attack, so they will have advantage on attacking the Barbarian. They'll probably attack the Barbarian a lot, and they'll hit a lot. They're going to hit those temporary hit points granted by Heroism, those hit points are going to be doubled because they're going to have resistance to the attacks, plus they're going to be taking damage every time they do it from the fire shield. Furthermore, that fire shield is going to give that barbarian resistance to yet another type of damage as well. So you could end up with a lockdown character that could be extremely difficult for enemies to deal with. I see this working particularly well with something like Path of the Ancestral Guardian that has an ability to lock down enemies as it is. This one's reasonably well known too, and it's the Simulacrum spell. We know already that this is probably a broken spell, uh, but let's just say for a moment that our wizard has reached 17th level. We now have the Wish spell, we have 8th level slots, and we have Simulacrum. So let's say we cast a Simulacrum on ourselves. Uh, so that Simulacrum now has all our spells. Now that Simulacrum is going to use an 8th level slot to cast Simulacrum on us again. Uh, and then that simulacrum will do the same thing. Rinse and repeat infinite simulacrums. Now, what can they do? Well, they all have their ninth level slot left, so now they can all cast wish spells. And remember, there are some wish spells that are risky. You can lose the ability to cast wish again. But if our simulacrum is casting wish, that's no concern. Now, I'm told there has already been some kind of designer ruling against this uh, or some clarification, maybe in a sage advice. I haven't been able to find it, uh, but... I'll tell you what, if I'm the DM, obviously this isn't something that should be allowed anyway, because it's a loop and it will break your game. Now the Bane spell is a spell that is often used as a way to make enemy attacks more likely to miss, but it's often forgotten that it also reduces the saving throws of the enemies, and it can affect multiple enemies. So if we combine this with another spellcaster, we could line up those enemies for spells that are going to be far more effective. So if you were to say cast Bane on an enemy, and then one of your allies was to cast Hypnotic Pattern, that's far more likely to be that game-ending scenario that Hypnotic Pattern can often bring. But speaking of reducing saving throws, let's keep in mind also that Slow will reduce saving throws as well for dexterity saves, and it will combine with a Bane spell. So we could have one character cast a Bane spell on the enemies, another character cast a Slow spell on those enemies. Both those spells are going to reduce those enemies offensively, but we also do things like line them up for a Fireball, just beautifully. Now I've talked a lot about the Spirit Guardian spell in previous videos. Let's talk about it one more time. One thing the Spirit Guardian spell does is it makes it so that enemies movement speeds are halved within the area of effect. Uh, and that can be okay for battlefield control, but if we combine it with difficult terrain, remember then those effects will stack, making it very hard for enemies to move at all. Then if you can do something like knock them prone, so they will be using half their movement just to stand up and have their movement half from the Spirit Guardians and have difficult terrain, you can have it so they can basically not move at all. Here's a pretty popular one. If you cast Polymorph on an enemy, often you have to figure out what you're going to do with that creature because maybe it's just a little snail with a single hit point. Uh, you can drop it from way up in the air and it might take 20d6 damage. But for some creatures, they have so many hit points that 20d6 isn't a combat ender. So that's when we would use something like the Disintegrate spell because the Disintegrate spell, if it reduces an enemy to zero hit points, it is disintegrated. So if we were to take that snail and cast Disintegrate on it, as long as we do a single point of damage, no matter how many hit points that original form had, it would be destroyed. Now both the Mounted Combatant feet and the Shieldmaster feet have certain aspects that are dependent on the size. Uh, so a Mounted Combatant, if their mount is a larger size than their opponent, they get advantage on attacks. While well, Shieldmaster is limited by size on what they can shove with their shield. So both these feats actually work 
reasonably well with the enlarge reduce spell because we can enlarge ourselves or our mounts or even reduce our enemies allowing us to make better use of those feats. Now the spike growth spell is a pretty good spell on its own but when we combine it when, with forced movements from other character features it can become an amazing spell. So because you take damage for every five feet you move through the spike growth it tends to do very nicely if we use things like the open hand monk or the shield master feet or thunderous smite as ways of pushing creatures through those spikes. Now the one thing is is once they're in those spikes it might be difficult to do anything more to them. That is unless you have a warlock that has Grasp of Vidar, because if you have Grasp of Vidar, then you have one character push the enemy into the spikes, and then the Warlock can pull them right back out, doing more damage, and then opening them up for further attacks from your party members. Of course, a Warlock that has Grasp of Vidar and Repelling Blast might have all kinds of fun if they're a high enough level, because then they could push the character into the spikes and then pull them right back out again. Now the Glyph of Warding spell has an amazing feature where it can have a spell effect that is cast on the creature that activates it. The limit on the Glyph of Warding is you can't really move it from its initial location. Of course, what if that initial location is in a demiplane that you can access with the demiplane spell? Then you could potentially have a whole bunch of Glyphs of Warding within that demiplane. Then you could access that demiplane and have all those spells take effect on you. Now why would this be such an amazing thing? because spells that normally would require concentration don't require concentration when you're affected by them from a glyph of warding. So we can give ourselves all kind of magical effects that would normally require us to concentrate, but we don't have to concentrate and we can stack them all up on top of each other. Speaking of stacking things, we know that the fine steed and fine greater steed spells will share spells with the paladin that casts it, or the bard with magical secrets that casts it, uh, so that if you cast something like, say, a heal spell on yourself, it will also heal your mount. Uh, but one spell that would combine very nicely if you are a bard who has magical secrets allowing you the fine steed spell, or the greater fine steed spell, is shape change. Because shape change should technically allow you to change form as well as your mount to change form. So you end up with two powerful shape changed forms. Now one combo I hear a lot about is allowing rogues to attack outside of their turn. And there's a few different ways this can be achieved. But the most common way I hear about is just having a battle master in the same group as the rogue. Then the battle master can use a commander strike that will allow the rogue to strike when it's not her turn. And that will give her the ability to use her sneak attack because it is no longer her turn. So on one round, you can have the rogue make more than one sneak attack. If you are a Battlemaster Rogue multiclass, you can actually do this yourself with Repost. So there's a bunch of combinations for you. I just have one more. This one is my favorite, so I left it for last. So let's say for a moment you have a character, we'll say they're a fighter, and that fighter has taken the mounted combatant feat. Then we have another character, and we'll say that character is a druid, maybe a Circle of the Moon druid, and that Circle of the Moon druid has taken the Sentinel feat. So the Circle of the Moon druid turns into a mount-style creature, and then that fighter mounts the druid. Now they go into melee together. So this is what happens whenever an enemy tries to strike either the fighter or the druid. So if the enemy tries to strike the fighter, the druid can take advantage of their Sentinel feat. But if the enemy tries to strike the druid, then the fighter can force the enemy to strike the fighter using the mounted combatant feat, and now the druid can still do their sentinel feat to get that attack. So the druid basically can get uh, an opportunity to attack regardless of who the enemy attacks. So there are some combinations I've heard of that I think are reasonably effective, and some of them maybe not so well known. Uh, now tell me a little bit about the combinations that you like best or maybe some that I haven't heard of in the comments down below and we can discuss down there. Uh, otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back and relax and I'm going to have some fun because D&D is for everyone. Thanks Optimancers and I'll see you next time.